Hi, welcome back to the Hope 2020 conference. Our next session is called Hacking Society and Hacking Humanity with the preeminent Bruce Schneier. And we're gonna take it right off to Bruce. Thank you for being with us, Bruce. Welcome. Oh, thank you. And thank you all for, uh, for showing up. I know this is uh, hard not being together. I was looking forward to Hope, to DEF CON, to, to a lot of things, and now we're all home. But I appreciate you spending the, the next hour with me. Uh, Title of the talk is uh, Hacking Society, Hacking Humanity. The real title of the talk is uh, what Bruce Schneier is thinking about right now. And I wanna talk about hacking. And uh, this talk will last maybe most of the session, a little less, and then uh, we'll take questions. So if you have questions, put them in the chat and then they'll be read to me because uh, I'm not gonna be able to uh, read and, and speak to you just because I have old eyes. So, so let's talk about hacking. And let's talk about it generally. Let's talk about hacking the tax code. And the tax code is, is code. It's, a, it's an algorithm that has inputs and an output. Uh, it has vulnerabilities. Uh, we call them tax loopholes. It has exploits. We call them tax avoidance strategies. And it has black hat hackers to find these exploits. And we tend to call them tax accountants or tax attorneys. And that I think is a very straightforward way of thinking about hacking of a non-computer system. And that's really what I've been thinking about and what I wanna talk about. So I need a definition of a hack. To me, it is something the system permits, but is unanticipated and unwanted by the designers. Right? Something that is technically allowed, but feels like a cheat. Uh, another definition I'm kind of working with is a, a clever, unintended exploitation of a system that one subverts the rules or norms of the system to at the expense of some other part of the system. Right? So you can, we, can, we can see how these uh, apply to computers and how they can apply to, to, to other things as well. Uh, hacking is a subjective term. Right? It encompasses a notion of novelty and cleverness. It's an exploitation. It's taking advantage of the system. It's a subversion. Unintended and un unanticipated, I think, is important. And hacks follow the rules of the system, but subvert the goal or the intent. And if we were to hack Zoom, we would do something that Zoom permits, but that its designers or coders really didn't want to permit. If we hack the tax code, we would do something that would be technically legal. But those who wrote that code, the, uh, the uh, IRS or the Congress or you know, whatever legislative body produces the, uh, the laws or regulations didn't anticipate. All right, so hacks are perpetrated on systems. Uh, system to me is an interconnected, interrelated set of rules or norms uh, designed for some purpose. So we could think of the system that is Zoom, the system that is the tax code. I'm going to talk about the system that is uh, the market, uh, the market, the economy, the system that is uh, our legislative uh, systems. Uh, designed isn't exactly right. You know, there's not always a designer. I mean, someone didn't design market capitalism. A lot of people had their hand in designing the U.S. system for passing laws. So maybe assembled is better. Uh, intent or purpose isn't necessarily right. It, there isn't always a purpose everyone agrees on. What is the purpose of our unemployment system? What is the purpose of our tax code? So functionality might be better, but I'm, I'm okay with the sloppiness here. These are good enough to work with. And, you know, we're dealing with uh, societal systems. So sloppy and imprecise is, is probably okay. And these are very general definitions, right? Hacks against computer systems, hacks against the tax code, the market economy, our system for passing laws, our system for choosing legislators and leaders. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our cognitive systems. So this is my, my, this is my big idea. Uh, we normally think of, of, of hackers as a, as sort of counterculture loners going against big, powerful systems. This turns out to be wrong. Most often the hackers are the rich and powerful. 
and they're subverting systems to increase their power. Ha hacking our how systems are subverted, but it's also how systems evolve. Many of the hacks I'm thinking about start out as hacks, but become normal, become the law, become regular. And the hack framework is very useful to understand and maybe solve problems in these social systems. And most importantly, when we start thinking about artificial intelligence and computers moving into more creative roles in figuring out ways to, ways to answer questions, they in fact will be hacking systems in a way where we're both used to and not used to. So that's gonna be my, my, my point. So I have about 11 general observations. I'm gonna intersperse them with, with different examples. First one, uh, hacking is ubiquitous. Right? All systems can be hacked. I think there is some theorem here, like Godel's incompleteness theorem, that all systems will have loopholes somewhere, inconsistencies, places where they're incomplete. Right? I mean, mostly we think about computers and computerized systems, but we can think about hacks against professional sports, hacks against airline frequent flyer mile systems, economic, political, social systems. Right? A system is just a set of rules or, or norms, right? I mean, they don't have to be codified rules. They could be just sort of the rules we all know to follow. And they could be rules that we create, rules that we are, are handed. You know, we can actually talk about how COVID hacks our immune system. And that is a perfectly reasonable conversation we would have because we talk about the intent of the immune system, even though there's no designer and no actual intent, and how COVID subverts the processes that we have in our body and our immune system. We talk about HIV and AIDS in the same way. Right? So even the best thought out set of rules will be incomplete and inconsistent. And there'll be things the designers haven't thought about. And the world around the system changes. So a system designed in one environment migrates into a different environment and hacks that didn't exist before are now possible. We know all about this in computer systems. It happens more generally too. Right? As long as there are people who want to subvert the goals of a system, there will be hacks. In a sense, people are originality engines and hacks are a normal part of this. And so we can think about hacks against ATM machines. And in conferences like this, we've heard many talks about different hacks of ATM machines. We could talk about hacks against airline frequent flyer programs. Right? If you fly a lot, if you flew a lot, I flew a lot, we learned about mileage runs and ways you can optimize the number of miles you get so they're worth more than the ticket you purchase. Certainly something the airlines didn't intend when they're putting these rules in place. Uh, some of you might remember the story of the, uh, of the pudding guy. Uh, this is 1999. A healthy Choice, which is a food producer, has a tie-in where you get frequent flyer miles for buying their products. And there is one person who searched for the cheapest qualifying product he could find, which turned out to be single serving pudding cups. He bought about 12,000 of them at 25 cents each. He got 1.2 million miles for uh, a little over $2,000. Then he donated the pudding cups to charity and got a tax write off. This is totally a hack of the system. Uh, closer to the work we do, we can think about hacks against uh, uh, casino games, like card counting, the, uh, the MIT group, and hacks against sports. I mean, sports are surprisingly often hacked. And a lot of the rules that uh, we see today as normal started out as hacks. Uh, in, in 1951 in baseball, uh, some manager uh, said, sent a three and a half foot tall batter a midget uh, out on the field because he had such a small strike zone. Now we know the first person, the first person who realized that you can curve your hockey stick 
and have the puck uh, fly a lot faster and, and, and get off the ice and change the game really forever. And since that person made that discovery, made that hack, uh, the, uh, the governing board of hockey, I think three or four times has changed the rule on the amount of curvature. Formula One racing is full of hacks. It was one year when some team fielded a uh, six wheel car. Everyone said, you can't do that. And they hand them the rule book and said, show me. And within about eight months, the rule book said that cars can have no more or actually no less just in case uh, than four wheels. Everything is hacked. And hacks are parasitical. And hackers are trying to subvert the goal of the system to their own first private goal at the expense of the rest of the system. And they're trying to gain some advantage for themselves. But if the system fails, the hack fails too. And if ATM machine hacks are so successful that there are no more ATM machines, then there's no more hacking of ATM machines. And if hockey disbanded because someone curved their stick and no one could figure out what to do about it, no curved stick, no hockey, the hack doesn't work. Right? So like any parasite, hackers can't be too successful. And I don't mean this sort of pejoratively. People are behaving rationally in their self-interest. Parasites are, are a perfectly normal part of, of, of our biosphere. And so when people hack, they're acting in their financial self-interest, or maybe their emotional, political, ethical self-interest, sometimes out of necessity if the systems are stacked against them. But they might have the goal to destroy the system. I'll talk about that a bit later. And you can see a lot of hacks in finance. Regulation Q was a longstanding United States banking regulation that was hacked repeatedly over the decades. In the 1970s, there was something called the Now Account. Back then, the rules on interest were very strict. You can only charge certain interest for what they call demand accounts, accounts that you can withdraw the money whenever you want. If you had timed accounts where you had to keep the money in the account for some fixed length of time, you could, you could uh, give more interest. And banks figured out a way to have a, what was legally a timed account that as far as the customer was concerned was a demand account. Totally a hack. Uh, 2010 Dodd-Frank, a regulation put in place after the uh, financial crisis of 2008. In the, in the past decade, there are repeated hacks of those rules. Uh, hedge funds are nothing but a series of hacks. There are lots of hacks against financial exchanges, insider trading, right? front running, where you have a, uh, you're, you're a trader and you're doing a trade for somebody else, but you trade on the information that you know before. Uh, that is illegal, but it's totally a hack. High frequency trading is a hack that, that is now a normal part of financial exchanges, but certainly unintended and unanticipated by those who built those exchanges, subverts a lot of the mechanisms, but it's normal. And this brings me to point three, hacks often become normalized. We're not used to that in computers. In computers, a hack is found and it is patched. You move out to broader systems and that, that often doesn't happen. And so there's sort of a, a process. The hack is discovered and used. It becomes more popular slowly. Some governing system learns about it. And then one of two things happen. Right? They change the system to prevent the hack. In the computers, it's a patch. In the tax code, it would be a new law. In uh, financial exchanges, it would be some new, uh, new regulation. Or the hack gets incorporated into the system. Right? The hack becomes a law. Uh, this doesn't always happen deliberately. Sometimes nothing happens and the hack gets normalized over time. It becomes the new normal. And many of the things we think is normal started out as hacks. I mean, think of, again, all the hacks on banking and finance. Hedge fund of hacks are, are mostly legal and are the new normal. And sometimes they're retroactively declared legal. Sometimes they are declared illegal. 
most of the time they're just left alone. I think it hacks against our, our political system. The filibuster is totally a hack. I, you know, it's, it's over a century old and it is now normal. Actually, it's older than that. It was a hack invented in the Roman Senate. All business had to be completed by sundown. And if you didn't stop talking, the business would never be completed. Right? Not giving a Supreme Court justice a hearing is a hack. And we actually don't know yet whether it'll be normal or not. We can think about uh, hacking economic systems, uh, monopolies, too big to fail is a hack. VC funding is a hack of market economics. Right? Markets are based on knowledgeable buyers making decisions amongst competing products and pressure to sell to those buyers uh, depresses prices and incents uh, innovation. That's the way the market works. That's the system. VC money injected from the side hacks that process, which is why you see so many completely unprofitable business models surviving. They would not survive in the normal system. Right? And the best strategy for a startup is to take enormous risks to be successful because you're funding your own out and you'll be dead otherwise. Right? And you can do it without worrying whether you're destroying something. And this is a vulnerability. This is a hack. Uber is totally a hack. We work is a hack. I guess we work well. It brings you to my fourth point, which is about money. Again, we normally think of hacking as something a disempowered do against powerful systems. It is more common that the wealthy hack systems to uh, their own advantage. Right? They are better able to discover hacks because they can devote more resources to the problem. They can buy expertise that they need to. They're better able to leverage hacks. And these hacks are more likely to become normalized because the wealthy can use their influence on that normalization process. A lot of ways uh, we hack laws. I mentioned Uber being a hack just on VC funding, but Uber is full of hacks because Uber hacks quite a lot of the regulations around taxis and limousines. Airbnb hacks a lot of the regulations around uh, hotels and uh, short-term rental properties. A lot of hacks involving jurisdictional interactions. That there's a, uh, I mean, a very famous uh, tax hack, which is now illegal, but companies like Apple and Google used it for, uh, for many years. And it involved the tax codes of Ireland and the Netherlands and some offshore tax haven and the United States. Right? Interactions between those four tax codes allowed these companies to shield uh, enormous amount of income from, uh, from freely from any tax at all. My fifth point, hacking is a way of exerting power. And hacking is a mechanism to gain personal power. <coughs> the disempowered do it to subvert existing power structures, the ways to bypass bureaucracy. And a lot of the world has really no choice in the global systems that govern their lives. So they really have no option but to hack them. And people always hack systems that are causing them problems. But the powerful do it to increase their own power and right, to influence the evolution of a system in their favor. I think there's a difference in the type of hacking these two groups do. The disempowered can be faster, but the powerful are more effective. Because mostly in our society, money equals power. We can look at uh, legislation. Lots of hacks in the legislative system hidden provisions in bills that are voted on and people don't know about, must pass legislation that you can slip riders in that have to be passed. Automatic lawmaking, US Congress has this weird system for something like base closures, when nobody actually wants to vote on closing a base in their district and they can't for political reasons. So they vote to establish a commission that will decide what bases to close and then they'll happen automatically unless Congress overrides it. So it's a way to vote on it without actually having a vote being recorded on it. 
or ways to delay legislations. You reading last week uh, on a, a hack in, in the Washington state legislature where there are bills that are put in process that are basically blank. So later on, if someone needs to pass a law, they can go to an existing bill and make an amendment, which basically means add the stuff. And they use that to hack whatever the process is about introducing legislation. All right, so my sixth point, context matters when evaluating a hack. Right, we're talking a lot about hacks, some are good, some are bad. Right, hacks subvert the intent of the system, but that's not always a bad thing. Some attacks are beneficial. Some of them are innovations. And in order to decide whether to normalize a hack, whether a hack should become the new normal, we need to consider the context in which the hack operates. Right, do we like the subverted system better? Uh, this is actually pretty easy to do when there's a singular designer or a clear focus on what the system is. So computer systems, it's really easy. Even for a sport, right, this focus on the good game uh, and being entertaining, human competition. Right? Someone curves a hockey stick and the governing body can decide, does this make the game better? Right? It makes the game faster, makes the game more exciting, makes the game more dangerous. And we could decide whether we're okay or not with that. Same thing with, I don't know, a new tennis racket design or a new engine in Formula One racing or a new yacht design, or, something, or, or a new way of, uh, of smacking the ball over your head in cricket. So it's easy in those systems. It's harder with systems with multiple designers, systems that evolve, systems where there isn't one truth about the intent, like the tax code, or the market economy, or democracy. Like these do not have single intents or goals. Like there's legitimate difference in, of opinion in the intent of these systems, which leads to legitimate different answers about what to do about a hack. Right? And since the system has evolved, no one is right. And we could have legitimate debate of what do we think about the filibuster or administrative burdens or blocking Supreme Court nominees from getting a Senate hearing. There isn't a right answer there. All right, so point seven, hacking is how systems develop, adapt, and evolve, right? Hacking is about finding novel failure modes. And when those failure modes actually work, they have unexpected outcomes and they can be positive. And hacks tend to be declared either legal or illegal by, by a more general system, right? So we can talk about computer hacking, which the system will permit, but the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is a more general system that basically says anything you do down here, we're going to declare illegal. We already talked about governing bodies and professional sports. Uh, tax authorities serve this purpose. When you invent a new tax hack, and they are going to adjudicate it. And they're going to decide that's okay or, or that's not. And systems evolve in this manner. And we have actually a very general governing system that we use to adjudicate hacks. And it is our court system. Right? Judges decide on hacks all the time. If there's a law, it has a loophole. I discover a hack, I use it. You say, you can't do that. You sue me. We go in front of a judge who looks at the system and says, yeah, that's okay. It was allowed. You're stuck. Or no, that subverts the intent. That's, a, that, that's not allowed. And now we have case law. Right? And that hack is now either legal or illegal. This is how the legal system incorporates beneficial hacks. It's how the legal system adapts to changing circumstances. And very important, the optimal level of hacking in a system is not zero. Right? Hacking gives a system the flexibility we need if it's a more abundant system, if it's a static system in a changing world. And evolution due to hacking can be faster or more, or more efficient than developing the system through the normal channels, right? Because it incorporates the adversary into the system and harnessed well, hacking accelerates system evolution. 
we could think a lot about hacking democracy. You know, we're in the middle of, of a U.S. election. And there's a lot of talk about different hacks on the election process, different hacks on, on how people vote and who gets to vote and what the process is designed to subvert the basic system of everyone gets to vote and we pick the winner. And gerrymandering is a hack. The United States, at least money in politics, turns out to be a hack. Misinformation is a hack. And we can go into details on all of these and how they might work. So my eighth point is that systems can be hacked to destruction. Right? Remember, hacks are, are parasitical. And, and like any parasite, too much hacking destroys the host, destroys the underlying system. Too many ATM machine hacks, no more ATM machines. Yeah, and, and, and we saw this a little bit in, in the 2008 banking crisis, that the system was hacked so badly that it might have collapsed completely. We were seeing shadows of it uh, for money in U.S. politics or with, with disinformation. It happens to extremes in political revolutions as sort of all the mechanisms of society get hacked for a different intent. So while hacking can be a good thing, uh, there can be too much of it too quickly. And how flexible a system is matters here. And a rigid system can break if it's hacked. A resilient system can evolve uh, in the face of hacks. On the other hand, uh, some systems need to be hacked in order to be destroyed. You know, we can think about immoral systems, systems of oppression. We can think about collective action problems where you know, we actually need to hack the system to destroy it to get a better system. Another thing I've been thinking about is, uh, is hacking cognitive systems. And, and we as hackers in the computer field are familiar with that. And there's an old adage that uh, script kiddies hack computers and uh, professionals hack people. And lots of attackers hack people. Like advertising can be a hack of our cognitive system of choice. It's always been psychological. Now it's very targeted. And lots of people have written about uh, how modern targeted behavioral advertising affects our ability to uh, rationally choose. I think of it as a hack. Right? A lot of my democracy and free market examples readily uh, you know, sort of use persuasion as a hack. Social media hacks our attention. And I've written about how terrorism hacks fear. I mean, basically, our system of fear is optimized for people living in small family groups in the East African highlands in 100,000 BCE. Uh, it's not well designed for uh, New York in, uh, in 2020. And terrorism directly targets our cognitive shortcuts about fear. It's horrifying, it's vivid, uh, it's a spectacle, it's random. It's tailor-made for us to exaggerate the risk and overreact. Our systems of trust can be hacked by institutions, by brands, by others trying to manipulate us. Right? We naturally trust authority and what that means can be hacked. Right? Something in print is an authority. The computer said so can be an authority. And a lot of these cognitive heuristics are, are being abused. I, mean, we, I can even say that junk food hacks our biological system of food desirability, which also was based on our 100,000 year old environment and dietary and is not based on modern processed food production. That interesting, a change in threat meant uh, that we have new vulnerabilities. So, uh, so this is my. Uh, there's a hierarchy of hacking. Right? And you think about everything I'm talking about, there is this hierarchy of hacking. There, there is rarely a single system in play. And most often, there are some nested uh, group of systems. Right? So if you imagine someone who wants to steal money from a banking website, right? so that person can hack the website itself, right? the code libraries the website uses, uh, the web server, the web browser, the client's operating system, the client hardware, the server hardware, and all the hacks we thought about work at this level. Okay. 
Now imagine someone who wants to hack, who wants to pay less tax. That's their goal. And most obviously, that person can hack the tax code and find new loopholes. But he can go up a level and hack the legislative process used to create the tax code. Or go up a different level and hack the rulemaking process used to implement the legislation used to create the tax code. Or he can go up two levels and hack the political process used to elect the legislators who create the laws that turn into regulations that are the tax code. Or you can go up three levels and hack the media system used to discuss the political processes to elect the legislators and so on. Or you can go up four levels, right? You can hack the cognitive processes that consume the media ecosystem used to discuss the political processes that elect the legislators that create the tax code that have the loopholes. Or actually, maybe you could bypass all of that, go down a level, and find a hack in TurboTax. The point is, we're talking about this hierarchy of systems of increasing generality, where the system above a governance system underneath it, but is also subject to hacking. And a powerful hacker can go up and down that stack. And this is why I say the rich and the powerful are better at hacking. Right? We see this in tax loopholes. We see it in hedge funds. Right? High frequency trading moves down the stack. Getting the carried interest loophole to try and law moves up the stack. In the tech context, moving up the stack is hard. In these more general systems, it's easier for the powerful. Right? Jeff Bezos can buy the largest home in DC to entertain lawmakers. Most of us don't have that capability. But it depends a lot on the hacker's skills. Right? Maybe I can find a TurboTax bug, but I'm not going to influence tax policy. A high-ranking politician can't hack TurboTax, but he can hire the expertise if he needs to. Patching is easier further down than higher up. Vulnerability in TurboTax, you can fix it in days. Vulnerability in tax code can take years to fix. Cognitive vulnerabilities can be impossible to fix. I think cognitive systems are the most dangerous of all because of that. Because they target things in us that are just not patchable. So I want to think about artificial intelligence in this context. And I have three things about AI and how it'll affect hacking. The first is that AI systems can be hacked. A lot of research being done in adversarial machine learning. I've written about it, others have. In ways that AI systems are computer systems, so they're vulnerable to all the computer hacks that we are used to. But there are additional hacks that because they are machine learning systems, they are vulnerable to. So we see examples of stickers being uh, placed on stop signs that we as humans don't notice, but uh, AIs that are doing self-driving interpret as speed limit signs. Or, or stickers you can put on the road that we as drivers don't notice, but an AI will, will swerve to avoid into oncoming traffic. So as AI systems and ML systems become more embedded in our society, they're gonna be vulnerable to these sorts of hacks. I think something that's very much we need to watch out for. I think that's the least of our worries. Also think about AI hacking us. And a lot of these cognitive hacks are being implemented by computers, but being designed by people. As computers start designing algorithms, they will be hacking us. And we see some uh, sort of very preliminary versions of that. The, uh, the recommender algorithms on, on, on things like YouTube that push us to extreme content because the, uh, the recommender system is optimizing itself for engagement. And it turns out outrage is a really easy way to incent engagement in human beings. You know, what, what scared us about Cambridge Analytica that seems to be largely to be not true is that system divided us by our emotions into categories and ad systems were able to target ads to us based on our emotions, based on, on the way we saw the world. 
right? The, the, the exact thing they did seems to have not made a difference, but that sort of thing is perfectly plausible. So as these AI systems become more pervasive, they're gonna start hacking us. Combine them with robotics, and they're gonna hack us a lot because we have a lot of strong cognitive systems on dealing with other people. And robots will subvert that. They'll be designed by, by others, maybe working against our interests, but we're gonna treat them as, as people in, in some way. And there've been experiments in this. And I have a colleague who uh, did an exper robotics experiment, gave uh, subjects a, a robot dinosaur, kind of a cheesy plastic green dinosaur but it was a robot, it, it had to uh, look like a child, it had a big head, big eyes, small body, it, it reacted and people became attached to it. And as part of the experiment, the researcher uh, told the subjects to take a hammer and smash the robot. And, and the subjects wouldn't because of that emotional attachment. That's a hack of our nurturing system. And I worry about something like a future Alexa which will be in our homes, will be our friend, will tell us stuff, and is actually working for a company against our interests. And it's something we have to be very careful about as we go forward. But the thing I am most concerned about is the notion of AI as a hack. And throughout this talk, I've been thinking about hacks as a creative endeavor as a fundamentally human thing to do. What happens when computers start hacking? And what happens when computers find vulnerabilities? I mean, we're already seeing ML systems used to find vulnerabilities in software. How much before you can feed an ML system the entire tax code? and give it the goal of minimize your tax. How many vulnerabilities will it find? 10, 100, 1,000, a million? I'm not convinced we are prepared for a million tax loopholes, for a million vulnerabilities. And more interestingly, an AI is not going to subvert the system the way we are. So most of you remember this, I'll tell a story anyway. Of, of the Volkswagen engine hack. This was not an AI system, these were engineers, and they designed the engine in, in certain Volkswagen cars to detect emission control testing and to behave differently. And so they built their engine, it would have one performance on the road that basically had violated all emission control standards, but during the test, the engine would behave in a way that passed all emission controls tests. Now that was done deliberately. That was a deliberate subversion of the emission control testing process. But imagine you uh, told an AI, your goal is to maximize engine performance and pass all emission control tests. It is perfectly reasonable that it would come up with that same hack. It wouldn't have a context to understand that it was not intended. And we might actually not notice unless we took the time to see what it did. And in complex systems, uh, that can be uh, prohibitively difficult. And this is always a possibility because the problem is that goals and intentions are always underspecified. It is not possible for me to, for me to Describe my intention, my desire with enough detail that it can't be subverted, that it can't be hacked. Right? You cannot tell the genie your wish in a way that he is unable to A, grant it, and B, in a way you wish he didn't. Right? The genie can always outsmart you because you can't, you just can't put enough detail in your wish. There's always going to be something you leave out. A lot of this is, is in, in humans is filled in by context. And if I ask you, uh, get me some coffee, you know 
not to buy me a coffee plantation. You actually know not to bring me a single bean. You also know not to go to Starbucks, find somebody with a cup of coffee, knock them down, grab it, and bring it to me. I don't have to tell you any of that. It's all assumed in the world we live in. But any kind of directed agent is going to have to know all of that and a lot more besides, or it's going to come up with some answer which technically meets the goal we established, but it is not something we intended. And I'm less worried about uh, goal hacking that we notice. Right? So lots of examples of that uh, on simulations. Uh, you know, there are video game simulations where the AI figures out a new way to hack the system. Uh, I saw a video of a driverless car driving around in circles because of the goal it got. It decided the best way to meet that was to drive around in circles. Right? We're going to notice that. Right? The car is driving around in circles. Let's fix that. It's the engine hack that I'm more worried about because we're not gonna notice it. It's the, it's the hacks of the tax code that I'm worried about because there's gonna be so many of them so fast that our system of recovery is just not gonna deal with it. Depends a lot on the domain here. Right? The difficulty of translating the, the rules to, uh, to the AI. It'll be a long time before an AI comes up with a new hack of a, of a game of hockey. Right? For, the AI to figure out to curve a stick. It's not only has to know the rules of hockey, has to know the aerodynamics of a puck and, and everything else beside a human physiology and, and sort of all those things. And that's going to be a long time. But more constrained systems, like the tax code, like our financial markets, it really feels like something that we have to worry about within the decade. If we ever get androids playing baseball, they'll come up with hacks. Until then, I'm not too worried. But in general, and this is my final point, we need to figure out how to harness hacking for social progress without destroying society in the process. A lot of complexity here. We want the hacks that, that benefit us. We don't want the ones that harm us. We want the rate to be a rate we can manage. We want our systems to be able to be resilient and adaptable. But I'm not sure how to get from here to there. So that's what I have prepared. Uh, this is probably my next book. So I'm, I'm really interested in anybody's comments. Uh, please ask questions. They'll be relayed to me because I'm not gonna be able to read them from where I am. Uh, but if you don't get your question answered, I have a comment that doesn't show up here, email me. I'd love to hear uh, what you think about this. This is uh, something I'm, I'm showing to a lot of different audiences and uh, Hope is a great audience for this in uh, some really important ways. So please, after this talk, Think about this and email me with, uh, with your comments. So with that, I'm, I will field questions. All right, thank you very much, Bruce. That was very interesting. We do have a few questions here for you. And I'll start off with the first one. The question was, uh, where does civil disobedience fit this model, especially right now with the quote unquote systems that let it exist versus quote unquote systems changing to prevent it, preventing hacks. So civil disobedience can be a hack. One of the things I'm struggling with is the boundaries of my definition of a hack. But right? if everything is a hack and nothing is a hack and my, and what I'm saying is useless. So to me, a hack is a subversion of a system and civil disobedience is often that. And that is a, a way that the powerless are hacking a system that's not working in their, in their favor. Now the powerful who like the system are trying to make that hack illegal, to stop the hack. It's sometimes uh, the hackers win and, and that's a good thing. And sometimes we're trying to hack a system to destruction. Right? It is an immoral system and we, 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 we want to destroy it. So I think it does fit in, but I'm trying to be careful about my actual boundary of what a hack is. I mean, some things are just breaking the rules and there's place for that as well. But hack is a subversion of the rules. And that's that I want that to be different. I can't hear you. You are muted. 
Thank you. Um, we have a few more uh, time for a few more questions. So the next question I'm going to read is, uh, what is the capability of individuals to willfully consent to or dissent from the effect of hacks that rich and powerful people do to the larger society, social economic media systems? So, Great question, and the answer is minimal. I mean, what power do we have if a bunch of hedge fund managers figure out a loophole in the financial markets and make a whole lot of money? We can complain to our legislators. Like, that's our power. It's not that great. And this is why, to me, the powerful use hacks to further entrench their power more than the powerless use hacks to gain power. Lots of examples of the latter. It's the former that worry me more because the powerful are more likely to have their hacks declared legal at the end of the day. The hacks we discover are more likely to be declared illegal. Got it. All right, I have a, a couple more questions. Uh, would you agree that the natural extension of your thought process is that we should dramatically simplify the statutes and regulations in our society so that is, it is easier to oversee that they have the desired outcomes and are acted upon in the intended way? You know, my guess is that is a nice idea, but, but will fail. I mean, society is complicated, right? It's like saying, you know, the way to better secure computers is to drastically simplify the computer systems. And yeah, it's a good idea, not gonna happen. We like complex systems for a whole lot of reasons. The world is complex, our desires are complex, our lives are complex, and the complexity of the systems, whether they're computer systems or the tax code, uh, reflect that. So simplification, I think, is a strategy, but I don't think it's one we can uh, adopt across the board because simplification has a lot of other negative effects that we don't want. Understood. Okay. Uh, one question here is, uh, <clears throat> what would be your top cognitive hack defenses? Wow. So a lot of people write about this and it seems like being aware of them is, is part defense. But if we, if, if we're primed to know that, Look, terrorism hacks, hacks fear, and here's how. We have some defense against it. Largely, though, we declare the hacks illegal. I mean, there are you know, unfair and deceptive trade practices. The Federal Trade Commission says you can't do that. And, and you know, that, we did that pretty well in the 70s. We, we stopped doing that. And we pretty much allow corporations to do whatever they want. So I think the best defense against cognitive hacks is the law. You know, you, of course, I mean, okay. it doesn't work against terrorism, right? Because right, terrorism is, by definition, breaking the law, but it works against uh, persuasive advertising, uh, dark patterns, uh, addictive products, you know, all of those things that, that hack us in different ways. I mean, we can say, look, as society, we think this is unfair. We don't want you to be able to do this. That's perfectly reasonable for us to do. Yes, I agree. Okay, and uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, can you, uh, what, what is your favorite hack that uh, you always like to use as an example? I know you use some good ones in your talk, but I just thought there might be one other one that's a favorite. No, well, I mean, they're changing all the time because I'm actually doing research in this right now. Uh, so, I mean, I tend to like historical ones. Like Voltaire hacked the French lottery, which is kind of neat. He actually shut down the lottery because he kept winning. And wow. it was a perfectly reasonable hack. Uh, there's, there's, I'm looking at hacks against rules right now. Uh, this is uh, used in uh, economics. And I, I'm still tracking out this as a real story. But supposedly when the uh, British ru uh, ruled India, one of the things they did to, uh, to limit the number of cobras in the world was, uh, was to pay for dead cobras. And you kill a cobra, bring it to us, we'll pay you. And the idea was uh, the people would kill cobras and for the reward. What people did instead is they bred cobras because they got more reward that way. Even worse, the, the uh, British government said, this is not working. They stopped the program. So everyone released the cobras into the wild. <laughs> okay. Pretty good story. That's a great story. There are a lot of these. I have, I have lots of stories. Sports hacks are fantastic. 
uh, because you know it, it is a system that is that everyone is trying to subvert for for personal gain. Uh, political hacks, I think, are often a lot of fun, especially historical ones. A lot come from ancient Rome. Surprising how many of our political hacks started out in ancient Rome. Right. So, well, so uh, I'm trying to find stories everywhere. Okay. Well, well, thank everywhere. you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Bruce, for out of time. And I really want to thank you on behalf of everyone here, the attendees and the staff. Uh, we really appreciate you coming and sharing your thoughts with us. It was very enlightening. Hey, thank you. Thanks for putting this on, even in the pandemic. You guys are great. All right. Thank you. All Bye right. All. And uh, we'll be back for the next show. Thank you very much, everybody.